Hello. Hello, hello, Jonah. Welcome. It's lovely to see you. It's wonderful to gather with everyone today for this conversation um, in marking what is for us, or for me, really a, a bittersweet moment, um, which is the last day of our exhibition, Li Ufan Open Dimension, which has lived now on the Hirshhorn Plaza for just over a year, um, along with the Hirshhorn director, Melissa Chu. I'm Anne Reeve. I'm an associate curator at the museum and I um, am co-curator of the exhibition. Um, and it's a joy to welcome Jonah, who um, I will introduce briefly uh, as an active choreographer and exhibiting artist since 2002, who cultivates a form of choreography merged and really interwoven with visual art and design. Jonah has authored 64 original works, which have been produced in 34 nations and has been the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships. Uh, the Jonah Boker Foundation, which he founded in 2002, is devoted to developing associated performative, choreographic, and visual arts projects, an incredibly dynamic and very, very busy and active program that you oversee. Uh, and I believe you also oversee three art spaces, one of which you are speaking to us from today, which we see behind you. Um, so it is, Jonah has also long been um, invested in and working in conversation with the work of Korean artist Lee Ufan. And again, Jonah, it's just a joy to see you and speak with you always, and especially to see you today for this conversation. And I just want to say, I think joy might be the word that I'm really feeling to see you. I feel as though I was just uh, next to you, at fa in fact, at the sculpture, beautiful sculp sculpture plaza and garden that is, you know, the Peerless Museum that we know as the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. But we were just side by side outdoors. At I know, I know. Very precious. Any, any real, real time interaction is very precious these days, certainly. Um, well, we have, we have a lot to get through today. I think we want to, you know, I, I think we should start by setting the stage a little bit, speaking about Liu Fan, about the exhibition, and then we can talk about your connection to the work and how that has developed and manifested over the past almost 10 years, maybe even more than that now. And then we can speak about the reason for that recent visit and the reason for the time that we were together on the plaza, which was that you were filming some um, performative, you know, some performance in conjunction and in dialogue with those works on the plaza. And we'll be able to excerpt and share some of that footage with all of you today who are who are watching. Actually, it's it's um, somewhat unusual, but particularly exciting for me to have this be the the mode and focus of our conversation, because it's rare that we get to have these sort of process um, style conversations with artists who are in the process of developing specific work. And, um, and I think we may even convince you to demonstrate for us through movement some of your current current thinking around around Liu Fan in this project. Um, so maybe why don't we why don't we get into the the work itself? Yes, let's jump in. Let's jump, let's dive right in. And um, for those who are logged on and watching um, who maybe haven't participated in one of these Hirshhorn artist talks prior, we'll plan to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we really will open up and encourage questions. So if you have them, please um, Please don't hesitate. Don't be shy. We'd love to. We'd love to engage everyone in a in a broader conversation. Um, okay, so we are looking at uh, an image of the Hirshhorn Plaza and its central fountain. Uh, Liu Fan is a Korean-born artist who is now living now in his 80s. Uh, he moved from Korea to Japan in the 1950s, and he's lived and worked primarily ever since between two adopted homelands, Japan and Europe. 
France. Uh, he first became known as an artist associated with a movement in the 60s called Monoha, translates loosely to school of things. And it, Monoha was a practice that was invested in very humble everyday materials, um, what we what might sort of think of colloquially as very minimalist materials, minimalist practice, um, that was invested in the you know phenomenology of experiencing the world as it is, right? The gestures were, were intended to connect us as, as viewers and as humans to the world around us through very, very specific gestures. Um, and this, this sort of set the architecture for Lee's entire practice, which has been both a paintings and sculpture practice in the years since. Um, Lee is a, active as a theorist, he's active as a writer, as a poet, um, and as, as we can see, a sculptor here. So the, this specific project was developed with the Hirschhorn over the course of several years. It was the first time in the museum's history that it had invited a single artist to work on its plaza, treat the plaza as a single and cohesive entity. Um, and in response to this, Mr. Lee developed uh, a series of 10 sculptures that are that were installed in August and September of 2019 on our plaza and have lived there since. You can see in some of these images that they rely on his primary materials, stone and steel. And stone for Mr. Lee calls to the natural world and a sort of geologic sense of time. And steel calls to the industrialized world or the man-made world. Although Lee will often make a point to remind us that steel itself is drawn from elements that are present in stone. So stone is sort of a, a mother of steel. Um, Lee places himself as an artist in the world as a mediator and not as, as a, you know, someone who devises a creative vision and imposes it upon a site, but who arrives in a space with his materials and enters, enters into what he views as a sort of symbiotic relationship, I would say, with the elements that he can control, you know, his materials and those that he cannot, you know, the, the wind, the air, the space um, that surround him, in this case, the, the Hirshhorn building and the, the National Mall. So the Hirshhorn was a specific kind of dialogue for Lee because it is such idiosyncratic and powerful and formalist architecture. It's really this, this heavy example of modernist and, and brutalist architecture that, that we know and those of us who are lucky enough to work there especially love very much. Um, but it is this really decisive modernist architectural statement. And Lee has spoken of his entire practice as a practice that has developed sort of as a way to push against that modernist idea. You know, if, if a modernist ideal viewed, you know, the artist as someone who, who had a, a specific interior vision and then imposes it on the world through an object, Lee instead wants to place himself as an interlocutor, you know, working with the world with materials, with forces that he can control, again, the made and the unmade, the things that he can't, all of those elements together form for him, for him, the work of art. So I, I don't think any of us, when this work was installed last year, could have imagined the year that was ahead of us. <laughs> and so, um, you know, for me, it's been very special to have the plaza reopened for the past month or so, so that people could reconnect with this work and, and see it through its life cycle. Um, but like, because it is work that is engaged in this encounter with forces around it, right? It is a, you know, it's a work of echoes and reflections and reverberations, um, you know, not just the stone, but the air and the space and the sight surrounding the stone and the steel that are key. There is something quite poignant, I think, in choosing to mark the last day of this exhibition through this, conversation and specifically through sharing a little bit of the work that you are that that you have undertaken Jonah in dialogue with these works and and this site um, so you know I know that you've been engaging with Lee's work for quite a while um, maybe you could 
talk us through how you first connected to that work and then in particular how your practice as a choreographer perhaps shares um, or you know has has a certain affinity with the way that Lee himself approaches his work as an artist. And thank you, and thank you. I also, in addition to thanking Anne and extending really the, the warmest welcome to some incredible colleagues that I see are attending today. I'm just looking at the photography of Kathy Carver. Uh, yes. <laughs> the miraculous Kathy Carver. It is so spectacular how she's been able to capture both these works, which are commonly described as monumental, and I, I'm of the thinking that they are, but mm -hmm. situating them in dialogue with the exhibition and program called Open Dimension and capturing this iconic building that is the mm -hmm. Mark. I'm very taken um, with these resources that the slideshow is running here. So again, the Hirschhorn, um, what a what a joy to be working with you. In bringing it together, because I see a lot of other colleagues and curators on the call too, or on the Zoom, um, it is really the work of curators um, such as Anne and, and many of you who may be listening today and joining us that have rendered what I do to become possible. Um, when I started working in museums and choreography really in 2002, after a short career with Tino Segal early on in London, I was already having a bit of a second or arguably a third act in terms of where my practice would go. So working so early in that, um, in that crossover space, let's say, um, is, a, is a line, is an aesthetic line of inquiry that I've really stuck to and been um, passionate about really from the heart, but also consistent with. So it would have been 2009 when um, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum and in particular its rotunda um, commissioning program that it came through curatorial rather than the notion of performance and dance being sort of programmatic or um, housed within education which those are wonderful places to be working but to have curatorial really commission choreography in a museum setting such as that um, I join Anne I, I harmonize with Anne in helping us create that frame because it was 2009 and in particular, Alexander Monroe's show called Marking Infinity um, mm -hmm. operated something as a retrospective for Mr. Lee at the time. Right. And one of the first major moments that in this country, people had an opportunity to connect with the work and its arc through history. Um, not only the work that he was currently doing, but the work that he had first sort of become most known for in the, in the 60s. Exactly. Exactly. And... Um, Anne has brought us brilliantly, I believe, to the Relatum series. Um, and our colleagues at the Hirschhorn have an image of that up. But where, where, I, where I hope I can make a bridge is to share with our audiences and, and for our recorded future is that the, um, Mr. Lee at the time and when we had our um, meeting, our encounter, his work is often described sort of as an art of encounter between elements and certainly between people. And there's a very dynamic way in which the elements confront one another um, in, in this artist's work. So in our encounter, um, we unearthed uh, two photos of a piece from 1969 at the Tokyo Expo called Things and Words. And this was an act, um, and we'll, we'll get to that word later, but this was an act in which Mr. Lee pinned uh, three sheets of Daitoku paper to the ground outside of the Tokyo Expo with his own body, sort of protecting these sheets and pinning them down in a way that protected them from the elements. And the imprint of his body became rendered into these sheets of paper, which he then ex exhibited indoors. So Anne, as usual, in a very organic, very uncanny way, was speaking about wind and the elements. So Mr. Lee allowed me to reimagine uh, that act. But this was interesting because at the time and shortly, shortly before that time, there had been a lot of dialogue in the museum world and curatorially around um, reconstitutions or around reenactment, as we say. So Mr. Lee and I crafted this language of how to reimagine that, perform that performance, which was called Things and Words. Um, and he allowed me to do it. 
he, he left me to sort of reimagine it because they really were the only two photos left. So I recall being on the plaza with Anne in um, open dimension and saying, well, this is very interesting that the project now brings us back out of doors. Mm -hmm. uh, sculpture garden with works such as, such as these multiple works at the Hirshhorn, which withstood time, pandemic, forced closure, weather, that this art or this art of encounter right. or that it withstands time. And so as we get into some of the other audio visual media today, and we hope that all of you will drop a little question in there and engage with us, you know, how does dance or choreography or this museum choreography practice, how does that dialogue with elements that are so permanent, such as architecture, sculpture of this scale, and outdoor work. So that is the um, that is where Anne and I became fast friends. Is well, how are we going to address that you know kind of aesthetic conundrum? So that's where I come at it, and we um, we like a bell. You know, ten years later, we revisit on vanishing, which in dialogue with the Hirschhorn a lot of Anne's colleagues and Hirschhorn colleagues that I hold dear, we felt that Open Dimension was so significant an installation that it needed its own um, context. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Open Dimension and On Vanishing, acknowledging both works. Or, right. or both. Right. And, and I think there's something in both Lee's approach and in your approach that allows for that, right? I, I you know, recall Lee especially talking about this work not as a declarative statement, but as an offering, right? It's an invitation to those who might wish to engage with it and experience whatever sort of powerful sensations of being in the world are, are offered by, by this work through, you know, through moments of reflection or curiosity. And the, the title that Lee gives to all of his sculptural, sculptural work, um, which he, you know, decided in 1972 that this would be the title of all of his sculptural work, both forthcoming and the and it would acknowledge the works that he had completed prior was the word that you used before, relatum, right? And this is a, a Latin term which refers to a component in an ongoing network of relations. Right, so it's not something that is static, but it is continually reverberating and um, and interdependent. Right, it's an art of interdependence and of openness. Uh, and as such, you know, I when I think of you engaging with this work, it's a it's in acknowledgement of that offering and in response to that offering. Um, and especially as we say goodbye to the exhibition. It's sort of an echo <laughs> that I think, you know, continues to offer something of a lived presence as, as well as the recollection of, of the work. Um, maybe you could talk about your approach as a choreographer, which as I understand it also embraces this tension between the pieces that you control and place into the conversation and then the elements that you allow to be open um, and and how that sort of plays out for you in your work. Thanks, Anne. Thanks. Yes, uh, to respond, I'd like to respond to you in an animated way and in a way that acknowledges our attendees. Yeah. And to say hello, all of you. We're happy that you're here. Anne and I are here to also engage with you. So in the meantime, though, I would say yes. The, the other thing, Anne, that I'm reminded of as, as our colleague Amy scrolls through these images, something, something came up for me watching these images. Um, I'm reminded of the friendship that I was able to forge with you as a, as a curator or, or, or embark on with you as a, as a curator. But during, the, um, during this outbreak in March of 2020, and while keeping a nonprofit organization and a practice like this open and remaining open in the United States, um, I was driving performing artists back to their homes in uh, New York State, and in particular in Hudson, New York. And what we did is we took a detour and we stopped by the Hirschhorn Plaza. 
And we wanted to visit these works outdoors and these sculptures, and we wanted to um, behold them during the outbreak. And our little hypothesis was, you know, these monumental works by Mr. Lee are going to stay put. <laughs> They're going to, you know, to withstand the pandemic, and, and they certainly have, but the unique architecture, property, grounds, sculpture garden of, of the Hirschhorn, I would like to cohere our thinking, including with our audience today, and to say the Hirschhorn, open dimension, the grounds, the sculpture garden, maybe futures therein, have really become a touchstone for people who visit Washington. Um, you know, how can museums and sculpture, do they drive tourism? Do they help an economy? There's also all of those questions, which some regions where I'm very active are also beckoning those questions. So along with um, Aaron Lee by Garvey, along with some of the dancers that you're seeing in these images, we stopped by and we visited the works and we, we looked at them and we thought, there, these are such primary structures. These are such primary structures. Like you said, beautifully Anne, is steel and stone and one being maybe the mother, of another form of materiality. So coming in with time-based work, is something I always return to. So mm -hmm. it takes time. <laughs> sometimes, you know, it's very rehearsal intensive. Sometimes a project will take years to mm -hmm. or to, to seek its appropriate fruition. So I think where I steer the conversation or even invite a lot of you that we see and know as attendees today is how does time happen? between, let's say, live art or time-based art and also works that are so permanent. And how does, how does time bring them together and in what ways are they different? So that was something I was working a lot on in um, working on this project with the Hirschhorn. Right. It's, you're reminding me that when we opened the exhibition, uh, Lee gave a very brief statement at the opening um, and he ended you know, very succinctly as is his want, um, but also in a way which I found very poetic with, with the words, you know, he was sort of talking about the experience of working in the museum and making the work. And we opened the, opened the show in late September, again, of 2019. And he ended his speech just by saying, fall is coming, right? And I think it was, when I, when I look back to that, I think of it as his sort of acknowledging that he was, releasing the last of his active connection to the work and that he was envisioning this forward space and really expanse of time where the works themselves would, would exist separate from him and in relation only to themselves, to each other and to the space in which they lived and to the surrounding world, world as itself moved through the seasons, right? And that that would sort of enrich this dialogue over time and these dimensions. Um, and of course, we lost six months of that of that period due to due to COVID. Um, and but that again was when I think of time that entering into the conversation I, and now sort of as we look to the exhibition's closure, I mean, when I think of Lee's work, you know, emptiness or silence is, is really a space of fullness and retrospect becomes its own kind of presentness. And I think that the work that um, you were, you've embarked upon in conversation with the work is going to help us develop, develop the life and the sort of living present of this work, even when, even when it's gone. Um, I'm, I have this quote here of Mr. Lee's, which I think maybe helps us speak to all of this. I mean, he just talks about his kind of quote, minimalism, which he says is a method that requires the space around the work to be energized more than the work itself. The work is not a text made up of signs. I want it to be an energetic living body possessing variability and contradictions. The situation of one brushstroke, one stone or one steel plate must become a living organism brimming with energy in its relationship to otherness. The inherent strength of the materials used is more important than my actions. 
and they must function as parties to a relationship, an interaction between the materials themselves and between the materials and surrounding space. Um, and when I think of your work, again, this idea of a living body <laughs> that is in conversation with another living body becomes animated in a, in a really lovely way. Well, I think the trend, one word we often use is transmission, at least in, at, at least in this um, voc vocation, <laughs> which is choreography. And it's always what the artist does with the art form, right? I mean, I've, I've made a, um, a gentle, but a very steady decision to steer the field towards the museum community, actually on rather ancient grounds. The fact that dance writing, archival work and museology were much closer than we now treat them. Mm. Uh, so I, I hear you and I think transmission also in its translation into French is often used for how dance is passed on. Mm -hmm. There is that. And I think also I go back to you on the, on the flip side of the coin is the art of encounter. I think that um, with Mr. Lee, it's very elemental, but there's also his encounters between people that are very strong. Mm -hmm. The actual, the notion, I would even call it the challenge to revisit the music of John Cage for this project, you know, which I thought I was gonna <laughs> fall, fall over. <laughs> when we were, but he, he deeply enjoyed the, the resonance with Cage, which is also the, yeah. the cello. It's also the score um, that we may see in here soon. Mm -hmm. So these echoes across cultures and, and his role in artistic decision-making as well. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll boil down to an encounter for me. Well, maybe let's, let's shift and start talking about the, the, the projects that, uh, well, I guess your reason for Washington and the work that you did here just a few weeks ago on site with with the the Liu Fan exhibition, Open Dimension. And I, you know, one thing that I, I am listening to you speak and thinking through here is just how, you know, part of this project and this conversation, you know, I, to me, it is an interesting opportunity for those of us who work in a museum culture and in a performance culture, uh, you know, the ways that we're having to renegotiate an understanding of our work in 2020 and amidst a year where the, the fact of gathering bodies in a space, um, which is really what the models of what we do at a museum and as performers are sort of based around, once that evaporates and that is no longer accessible to us, how do we forward a creative conversation that is worth something and what are the you know, what are the new muscles that we need to flex? <laughs> and what unanticipated surprises and really exciting surprises might exist on the other side? And so, you know, I think we had originally spoken with you, Jonah, quite, quite a long time ago, before the exhibition even opened, I believe, about the prospect of bringing you and performers to the Hirshhorn and staging a public performance where we would have you know, gathered an audience on the plaza and, you know, where we would see this sort of re-engagement of yours with this work at the Hirshhorn site with, with this new work. Um, and given that because of the circumstances of the year and because of really COVID, we were unable to move forward with a performance, we came to this idea of, you know, a very quiet <laughs> filmed engagement, solo engagement between you and the work. And that's what you came down to, to film a few weeks ago. Um, so talk us through that and, and what your approach, how, you know, what those shifts did to the way that you were approaching the project and then the way that you decided to work when you were on site. Sure, sure, this is great. Uh, now there's great parody between Anne and I. We, I sense that there's a, a relationship here. There's also a lot of overlap between um, the Hirshhorn family and our um, organization and my studio. So in answering that, I wanted to say that I try to arrive as an artist that is attuned to the to the host, to the organization, and really to all sides of the puzzle. So. I think that very, and I see also a question from, from 
Jean as well. And I, I, I just did a little chat. I'm sorry if I wasn't on mute, but Jean, just to say that we see you, we see all of you and a lot of great friends today. I arrive and I, Anne's question makes me think of the very special facility and the sculpture garden and, the, and that it withstood the pandemic very resiliently as did Open Dimension and where all of that's headed. So as in running a small nonprofit and you're seeing the first of its arts facilities, which dates to 2002, we might even dance for you in a moment. But so in keeping our nonprofit and our cultural organization alive, healthy, well, resilient, I, I don't want to over speak or overstate, but somehow this small, dynamic, vital, very diverse nonprofit has stayed sort of pandemic proof or recession proof. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it now. I'm going to knock on the wood floor. But we're, we're talking about an organization that hasn't had to cancel or, mm -hmm. or postpone. And it's being flexible enough and radical enough in our hospitality and in our generosity to say, if this program have, has to change right now, and if we need to navigate new times, come to us you know, as artists and a nonprofit staff, and we can join you and we can figure this out. So it's Anne Reeve and it's Team Hirschhorn who figured out the fact that the sculpture garden and its safe reopening, there's a safe way of doing it. So to make a bridge or, or even to segue, there is a safe way to do it. And so what I think we would like to, I, we're just gonna wink to you all on this webinar and say, there is a um, two channel film work um, that I hope will do justice to Open Dimension. And we're going to show you a five minute trailer of that today. Um, but there's also a future live work that we really, you know, we, we, we're not ready to drop that yet, but that we have, not, we have not left you in terms of the program that has been slated and the fine work that Anne and the team did. Right. Finding a way forward in our times so that public audiences and can, can really receive and continue to receive art as a touchstone. So um, Unvanishing has morphed before. <laughs> and it is now actually being revisited and revived part as a two channel film work. And there is a future live work coming to the Hirschhorn actually once our society is safer and can do it in the right way because we're all coming together to let you know that the live is what's is what you're next going to hear about so yeah yeah it's remaining um on your part very very generous and very nimble in terms of the way that we've we've been operating um well do you think it's a good moment to share that footage and maybe we can all take a look at it and then we can hear from you in a bit more detail about about what we've seen sounds great and as you guys do the footage i'm going to do a little costume change <laughs> Excellent. A, qu a quick change.
man, it's going to be quite an edit. I think it's. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. 10 more to go. <laughs> only, only a tiny little bit. Well, already in that, I mean, I, I have many thoughts and many questions, but you referred to the score earlier, which I know is a, is a cage score. Maybe you could talk through why that selection was initially made and how, how it's proven appropriate as a way to sort of frame, frame out the, the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the score is called one to the power of eight. So it's in, in classic John Cage, uh, you know, whom we love. One cellist to the eighth power. So actually with, through Cajun um, chance operations and methodologies, multiplying the octaves and the usage of sound and tom is, is very Cage. But it can also be done, as some of you, I just sent little hellos and a lot of love. To yeah, I saw that. And, so, and to some of you individually, so we're so glad to have this turnout today. But, but as some of you, even who are attending, and we, we see you, um, one to the eight can also be 108, which is 108 musicians. So that was that score was used in Venice, where Merce Cunningham and Robert Rauschenberg reconciled their friendship and their collaboration, and where they kind of healed Mm -hmm. uh, 40 years later in Venice with Interscape that debuted in Washington. So this was, this was interesting. Of course, we're doing the solo version, not the 108 person. <laughs> but so, so there is an echo there and mm -hmm. there's a geographic echo as well. The fact that that score would maybe arrive back with the project in Washington. Um, so that is the score that you just heard and Lauren Kayoshi Dempster um, is its interpreter, who also played the original score of Interscape. So for those of you who are kind of like Anne, who might be curatorial or may have a collecting interest or may be on a committee, that's kind of like the varsity level. <laughs> you know, is the score is coming back 20 years later to the sure. Right, right. Can you talk about the, um the choice of frame that you used while you were on the Hirshhorn Plaza and how you were using two cameras simultaneously. Can you talk about the, yeah, just, just your approach there and, and how you were thinking that through? Thanks, Anne. Um, so what you were just seeing was a split screen. Its aspect ratio is customized. In fact, I leaned on a family member of mine um, who I think is on this webinar with us, uh, Emile Bocaire, who hails from Stanford. And I see some Stanford folk, hello, hello. We really want to engage with you all. So Emile in cinematography, much like I do, is I, I called and I consulted with him and I said, look, you know on Vanishing, here's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and Anne was with me on the plaza, but for, and as was Amy, but for those of you who weren't there, we conceived of the idea of two cameras who pretty much were plumb lined, one under, underneath the other. So, but not always, sometimes we had to get different angles, but the span of these sculptures and the span of this iconic architecture is vast. So we tried to get you a good dance studio today that was sort of, Life. But nevertheless, the, what you're seeing is what Anne and I affectionately named Baby Bear, which is the little camera. There is a baby bear and a mama bear, right? Yeah. And, and mama bear was definitely the mother. And she was, so the two camera angles were going like this in an attempt to span the works. So my role in my dancing body, as you may have seen, is a bit of a figment. It's, it's not a dominant presence. It's really acting in a supplemental way with the architecture, with these very permanent materials, almost like a, you know, a band that crosses in time or that's fleeting in time. So that's what we're talking about with Anne and more of like the cinematography realm. And it's gonna be quite an edit. For those of you who like process, um, we have our hard drives here. <laughs> We really, we've got a lot of footage and Anne and her colleagues really stewarded it outdoors and safely about two, three weeks ago. Two or three weeks ago. 
And, and then in terms of the, the movement itself, could you talk to us about, a, I'm, I know that as a choreographer, we've spoken a little bit about your method, um, and which, which begins with a base phrase and then evolves from there in situ and, and in time. Could you sort of talk, talk us through that for, for those of us who are less familiar with, with your method? Thanks, Anne. Cool. Anna, even <laughs> and maybe show us. I mean, and maybe show us. That's a lead into, you know. <laughs> I've donned the costume. Of yes. That. We could show the base phrase. Should we sort yeah. of show? Yeah. Why don't you show us the base phrase and then yeah, let, let's let's start there. Okay, great, great. So briefly for those of you who it looks like we have a lot of people with us, some on iPad, some on various monitors. Thank you for joining us. And Anne and I really, as well as Amy, we, we put a lot of thought into this and we reserved this space, which belongs to our nonprofit. And basically you get, you know, you get a few schools of thought, you get many schools of thought. Choreography that is very set, choreography that is notated, choreography that responded to a moment of cultural revolution or two or three choreography that is improvised. And then really much like in curatorial studies where we're at now is more of an, if I may, an altar modern, which is looking at the global South in a very intensive way and looking at all voices. So where I've been working for about 17 years having existed within many traditions and honored them is this base phrase and then distributing that base phrase to performing artists who are really quite tribal and loyal to the organization. One is on this call, Nadia, I see in, in our, so Nadia knows a bit about this and Nadia next time, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you on the bus. But we're talking about setting something, distributing it, and then saying that the culture and the location, and in fact, the anatomy of the dancer changes the phrase, which it usually does anyway. Mm -hmm. so it's our engine for how we work in museums. And, right. and I, I, yeah, and it's exactly hearing that narrative, which to me strikes a really resonant chord with Liu Fan's practice as well, right? Of this sense of material as an offering, um, which is then encountered by and, and completed by those who engage with it. Right, and that it changes. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, wonderful. So shall we? Shall we dance? Is everybody? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my camera off so that the focus is right where it deserves to be. I will be back. Um, it's great to have you, and we're going to give you a little base phrase today. We are live from um, the first and maybe the last standing performance space in Bushwick, Brooklyn, today. So. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Jonah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I was sort of, I'm, I was mesmerized and sort of meditating on that. That was really, we've never been able to do something like that before in one of these talks. So that was so lovely. Thank you for sharing that with us. I always want to figure out how we can continue making culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk to, talk to us about that phrasing that we just saw. So we would begin our day with an hour long warm up. And then we go into something called solo studies. Um, Nadia, you know, Nadia, we, we see you here. So the solo studies postulate, you know, after, and again, I'm big on crediting people. So um, some have said that Merce Cunningham maybe trained my body, whereas Robert Wilson trained my use of the stage, museum and design components. and. I think where I come in, especially because our performing artists really are quite, um, you know, globally, regionally, um, continentally diverse. So I'm looking at Nadia because she would she would know a bit about this, and some of the diamond mm -hmm. uh, are a nod to her. Mm -hmm. From a base phrase, we then go into solo studies. So we're actually asking the material to change. And that authorship, you know, to have the courage that authorship is distributed. And what it does is it, it, it does two things. It creates um, an unusable amount of material. So it sort of explodes the amount of material that one has. And then paradoxically, it works well for museum projects because museum projects tend to really dilate the temporality of the experience. So. It works. It, it's when you've got a big archive of material and performing artists who've really worked together for a long period of time, you can deliver quite um, long durational uh, mm -hmm. projects. So, and I'm big on crediting the performers and, of course, and her staff, Erin, who works with us in Hudson. And Wonderful. So, I am. Very happy to see that we have some questions coming through in our Q&A, some really wonderful questions. So maybe I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, and thank you to both of you who have submitted thus far. Um, I experience so much less noise from the cities nowadays. Is that the same in Washington? And did that make your approach to the work more intimate? Uh, I like that. I like, I like that too. That question. Um, the my sense is that we have we have a din. You know, we have a bit of an urban default din. That and the sound of the city, right? I mean, I, I think that whether we are sheltering in place in a big city such as Washington or New York or LA or others um, or or Hudson. <laughs> is that the, exactly. Is that the sounds of the city are changing? Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a, there's a spectral silence, right? Because there's less going on in the streets, but the sounds have changed. I hear a lot more ambulances, cop cars. I hear different sounds. Construction is getting done because it was allowed to open before culture was. So the sounds of the city are different and the society is, I don't know, it depends on the city, but that's something that I hear. But some of you may have heard a motorcycle pass by um, which is very, you know, which is very this part of Brooklyn. So. Yeah, I mean, it's making me think about the time that we were together in Washington as you were filming, because I do, it, it did feel to me incredibly quiet. Um, and part of that, I think, was the fact that I, I think on the mall, I have noticed a quieting in Washington. Um, and then there was the, the fact that the plaza itself was not open. So the number of tourists and all of that sort of frenetic activity that you get generally with passers-by and passing and, and those who are passing through the plaza was, was quieted. And we were able to sort of have Jonah on the plaza as the sole presence, really. Um, so that it, the works and the architecture were 
were absolutely primary. There was nothing distracting from, from those elements as, as Jonah, you were choosing to engage them. Um, and it also had to do with the specific time of day, right, where we were filming, which was right as I think we began filming late in the day, 4 or 5 p.m. And then it was really the sunset that shut us down <laughs> over the, the three days that we were filming. And there was something just in my experience of sort of being in that space with really no one around that was very quiet and um, that contributed something to to the gesture and and I feel like that comes through in the footage that we just saw. And and brought about daylight. <laughs> but, you know, we the again crediting the staff of of the nonprofit organization reserve this space today, which is now two weeks into a safe reopening. And our kind of theory of change is that solo um, activity with cleanings. So that's how we're sort of able to do it in Brooklyn, New York from this facility. But Anne and I and Amy, you know, I would, I would arrive, I keep it very simple, very monastic. I would dress, I would warm up in where I was staying and I would dress and I would walk over with the camera and Anne and Amy and I would figure this out. And we were, we were convinced that there was a safe way to do this. And it required just a very positive, very adventurous appetite. So we would meet in the sculpture garden and we would film and we would dance. And Anne and Amy were very supportive and, and um, scholastically sort of watching it all. And right, and I should say, I, that's a good point. We should clarify, of course, that we were not only out of doors, we were all masked. Um, and Jonah would remove, you would remove your mask for the the moments of performance. And then, and we, we were, I think, all together being very conscientious about, about safety in this moment as well. Um, there's a wonderful question, another, a second wonderful question from Virginia here. Um, talk about the process of taking a three-dimensional expression that has no frame and making it a two-dimensional framed event. I have found filming dance, to, or yes, filming dance to be really difficult and few people are successful at it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I, I have some thoughts about that in relation to Liu Fan in particular, but I want to see how, yeah, what what you think, Jonah, first. Thank you. I, I've been doing some double time. You guys, some of you have received typed replies to me, but Virginia, I really want to join you on that. And I, I think we have the audience for it on, on every level. So briefly, um, there's a, and from my point of view, there's a genre called dance on camera. And it is an increasingly developed genre, which is dance on camera. And I would, again, credit and I would hearken back to Charles Atlas and the work that he did really dating to mid late like, 60s with Merce Cunningham. Actually, what is often not known is that he was the stage manager. Hmm. So that footage began to stem from backstage work, but it was filmic as opposed to video art, which came later. But those artists, um, and a part of why we're giving you kind of the long view today is because there's, to, to cut to the chase, right? Perspectival space, stage, often the graphic arts, et cetera, have this vanishing point, right? Which brings us, I mean, the piece is called On Vanishing. So perspectival space tends to go like that. Whereas a camera, its lens is spherical. So they are, the media actually are opposed. They're not irreconcilable, but they are um, opposed in terms of perspectival space. Virginia, though, is, you know, Virginia, I want to meet you. <laughs> but the 3D expression, I, I sense a nod to sculpture and I sense a nod to the body in her question. And where Anne and I were really became even closer as colleagues was we were like, well, wow, how are we going to get each relatum into the frame? without it being about the rest of Washington DC that's above the landscape. So it was a bit of a MacGyver act in terms of cinematography. I consulted with Aaron, who's in Hudson today, with David Hammonds, very much on a public sculpture front. I consulted with Emile, dancers. 
So just getting the frame and the shot and then saying, well, where can the body exist in this cinematography? That was, that was very the outdoor, that was like our field work going on. Mm -hmm. I think Virginia is also talking about filming dance to be very difficult. And I agree. And where, where, where this is headed is a 45 minute work, which is in its form two channel. So day one with Anne and Amy was really just the landscape and setting the shot. So very often there will be stillness in this two channel work. So I hope that answers the question. And channels, it means that there would be multiple, as you saw, it's like the split screen. So there's channel one, channel two. And they are also in um, an encounter with each other. Um, that, that's really interesting. It's really interesting, both the question and to hear your take on it, Jonah. What I, what keeps coming up for me in this idea of the frame and of your work, your bodily work as a way to sort of break that frame is hearing Lee himself talk about the plaza. Maybe Amy, we could go back to some of those plaza shots. Um, the Hirshhorn building is this is a, this circle, right? It's a concrete clad ring that is on you know, the equivalent of these four stilts that hold it up and raise it off of the plaza. And the plaza itself surrounds the building basically as a square. And at the, the perimeter of the square, we have these sort of six plots on either side um, where traditionally the museum has placed sculpture. So the, the plaza itself is a frame for the building and Bunshaft as an architect, I think was very conscientiously working, working with that, right? As you're framing this modernist form within a very delineated and uh, clear, clear space. Um, and then Lee Ufan spoke quite often about not only that idea of the frame and the circle of the building as its own kind of frame, but of these plots where you see on the perimeter and here you can see it sort of on these grassy plots or to the, the rear, the background of this image beyond the fountain where he was working in placing different, different sculptures, different relatum works as their own frames within the larger frame. All of this to say that as an artist, he was extremely conscientious of this idea of breaking the frame, right? Of taking these delineations, these architectural delineations and using his work as a way to fray those edges. There's a work called Step by Step where he takes the, I think, yeah, there it is. So you can see in that way, he sort of breached the frame of that perimeter edge, which was something that I know he was he was approaching quite conscientiously. Um, and he also spoke a lot about this idea of the fact that this wasn't for him an exhibition of 10 individual sculptures, but that it was an exhibition where he was working with space, right? So all of these works are speaking to one another. They're speaking to the building and, and the fountain and the work that include, that um, makes use of water and reflective, you know, all of those reflections were very, very important to him as well, right? This idea of reverberation, of echo and of, um, you know, of, of vibration really, I think, which is a word that he's used in his writings on work as well. So, you know, I think of Jonah, the interventions that you were staging and you know in your encounters with with each one of these works as a way to to sort of gently massage those frames away <laughs> and continue to to play with them and um yeah I, I agree you really had a lot of thoughtful work to do in terms of how to bring that back into a filmic image to reflect all of that um and when i was noting, you know, as, as we were watching that excerpt, all of that was really coming alive for me too, right? The way to sort of feel that reflective quality in the, in the surface of the fountain, for example, where you're watching the building and the end, the work that Mr. Lee has done surrounding the fountain and then the fountain itself all kind of in dialogue with, with one another. And this reminding me of day three, when we were, when we, we, we were, okay we've got three more to go and on day three I went over to Anne and we were both masked I was unmasked well 
performing, but all of the pre-production was masked and we did it well, thank you, Anne. But I went over to her and I said, these works are really breaking the frame architecturally. They, they are just breaking the frame. And it made me think about, I know that we shot on foot and by tripod and in a couple of instances by hand, but where I, again, would come back and applaud the Hirschhorn is these images which are circulating now by Kathy Carver achieve this uncanny ability to get two works in one shot, as well as their situation in space within Gordon Bunshaft's masterpiece. So photographing the work proved very difficult. So then to Virginia's point and so many others of you to do a cinematography that doesn't cut the, the piece and that can then contain a landscape for dance. That really was our work on this one. And absolutely, I mean, you certainly had work cut out for you in that regard. Um, so I see we've, we've already run over our allotted hour. Um, so I want to extend very, very genuine thanks to everyone who has joined us, those of you who have submitted questions, those of you who have taken time on this Sunday afternoon to be with us, sort of send this exhibition off into its next life uh, with us, and especially to you, Jonah, for the friendship and the thoughtful work and attention um, and collaboration that that you have sort of so generously brought to bear with your work on this project. And I want to, before we close down, I just wanted to see if there's anything that you would like to make sure that we note or acknowledge before we, before we sign off. I, I'd like to thank Anne and Amy. I'd like to thank Hirschhorn Curatorial and its leadership, Melissa, Smithsonian experiences. We had a lot of people come together on this one. Um, there's one more in the Q and A. Oh, is there? And, oh, and I see many. I see many little angels on the call <laughs> from all zones. So that's actually where I was headed. Is thank you for supporting me here, Shorn. Thank you for supporting my organization, and we came together convergently to navigate. Um, through these times and to, con to continue making culture, not to cancel, but to deliver something hopefully into your lives that is inspiring while beholding that dance and, you know, museum studies, sculpture, that we can converge and find a safe path forward these days. So I see so many friends and champions on this call and I'd like to thank you all for supporting the cultural institutions in this nation because that's really, um, we need you more than ever, and, and thank you for making this all possible. A very, very fitting way to close us out. So much, con much and continued gratitude to one and all, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Agreed. Thank you, Anne. Bye-bye. Thank you.